Uh, hello, everybody. I'm your, your moderator, uh, co-chair of a conference with Karen, Professor Karen Merchadani, and I'm here just to help uh, start the session uh, and to tell you a, a little bit uh, of, uh, of our practice in terms of uh, the uh, question and answer period in particular. Uh, you'll get a presentation, you'll get someone introducing the speaker, you'll get a presentation from our keynote speaker, Stephen Billet, in a moment. Uh, uh, our practice here, and it'll be repeated in the uh, paper sessions as well, uh, is um, for people, if they want to ask a question, to use the chat function uh, on their screen. It's a small dialogue bubble that says chat, and simply to enter their name in that. Uh, and this will produce uh, a speaker's list. Uh, you can enter it at any time. If you're already <laughs> anticipating a question, just enter it right now if you'd like. You'll be first on the list. It's kind of the equivalent of lining up at a microphone, a, a microphone at a traditional conference, and so that's our practice. And uh, when uh, the keynote is finished, the presentation, I'm going to use that as a speaker's list, and then call on you, unmute you, and you'll be uh, have the opportunity to ask your question of the keynote. Uh, so hopefully that's all clear. Um, and uh, so right now my job is to introduce uh, the introducer of uh, Stephen Billet, our first keynote. Uh, introducing Stephen will be uh, Armeg Adurian. She's one of the several shining lights we have in our doctoral research program in the area of work and learning at the University of Toronto. And she's generously and enthusiastically wanted uh, to uh, help us out in this way. Uh, she's followed Stephen Billet's work in many years. We teach it in many of our programs. And I'm going to pass it over to Armeg uh, for our uh, introduction to the keynote. Uh, Armeg, um, can you, uh, over to you. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I just want to also extend a good afternoon or evening or morning to everyone on the uh, call as well, wherever you are, whatever time zone. It's so great to virtually be with such an international audience. And this is definitely a first for me uh, as Steve, as a, uh, Peter mentioned, my name is Armie Gadurian. I've completed my second year as a PhD student focusing on workplace learning and social change. And I'll be sharing more about my work on day three of the conference, but right now back to our keynote. It is my pleasure to introduce our first RWL 12 Toronto Conference keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Billet. Stephen hails from Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia, where he is Professor of Adult and Vocational Education in the School of Education and Professional Studies. He is also a National Teaching Fellow and Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Of special importance to this audience, he is a member of the Researching Work and Learning International Advisory Committee. Since 1992, Stephen's research focuses on workplace learning and learning for vocational purposes. He, he has worked for the Australian Research Council and sits on the editorial and advisory boards of several academic journals, including the Journal on Workplace Learning and Empirical Research in Vocational Education and Training. Stephen is, in particular, the founder of Vocations and Learning, a journal that he was personally a huge and successful effort for him. The Stanford World Ranking of Scientists place, places Stephen in the top 1% of researchers in the field of education with a ranking of 38 out of over 58,000 researchers. In light of this standing, and as something that uh, Peter already mentioned, I'll share that for me, a small but personal note in all of this, is that because of Stephen, the word affordance has become part of my everyday workplace vocabulary since I first encountered his work as part of my Master of Education program in Peter's class back in 2018. Stephen currently leads research projects in Australia, Norway, and Singapore on learning across working life, confronting changes in working life, supporting adults, learning across working life, and the status and standing of occupations and provisions of tertiary education. He has been invited to give keynote or plenary talks on over 70 occasions across countries in Europe, Scandinavia, North America, and Southeast Asia. And today he is virtually here with us. His keynote speech is titled Learning Across Working Life, Educative Experiences and Individuals Participation. Let's give a big virtual welcome to Professor Stephen Billet. 
Thank you very much, um, Amik, for that uh, that very warm welcome. And it's nice it's nice to have this opportunity to engage with people. Firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to the Jagara and the Terrible people, their elders, past and emerging. I'd also like to um, thank the organising committee to who have organised this conference because it's been very difficult, and we appreciate the efforts that committee has gone to 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 organise this event. And thirdly, I'd just like to um, acknowledge colleagues across the world. It's late afternoon in Toronto. It's late evening in Europe and Scandinavia, 4 a.m. in Singapore and 6 a.m. here in Australia. Uh, welcome. But this is part of what seems to constitute working life at the moment. So let me progress. Um, what I want to propose is as follows. <clears throat> that knowing more fully what constitutes learning across working life and how working age adults negotiate occupational and work, workplace transitions is becoming more and more important for working age adults, their workplaces and the communities in which they live. And that drawing upon a current investigation of working age Australians and work-life learning Two concepts emerge as being explanatory for understanding and supporting that learning. Firstly, there is accounting for the broad range of educative experiences that afford opportunities, support participation, guide and augment that learning. And these experiences are far more expansive and inclusive than those afforded through lifelong educational programs, that is the taught provision of, of courses. Secondly, personal unique pathways of experiences or personal curriculums illuminate how adults, come, these adults, um, engage with work and learning across their working lives. And so together, these explanatory bases offer ways to capture and understand what constitutes learning across working life as shaped what is afforded by adults, to, to, afforded for adults and mediate it and engage with what is afforded them. And these um, concepts, you know, I argue, can also assist reshape what constitutes lifelong education to be broader and more inclusive and, and instantiates and elaborates what is taken as work-life how I'd like to proceed is as follows. Firstly, brief discussion about lifelong learning and education, describe briefly the, press, the, the investigation, and then this concept of transitions in working life and the importance of that. Then the kinds of learning that we've identified as being essential for work life and the educative experiences that have assisted these informants learn to negotiate and progress across their working lives. And then this concept of personal curriculum and how that shapes the pathway, the journey that these working age Australians have taken. And then in prospect on learning and education and then to finalise with so what. Let me start then. So, as working life gets longer, subject to greater occupational and workplace change, learning associated with employability becomes more salient for working age adults. Now, when I refer to employability, it's not just about getting a job, it's about sustaining employment as circumstances change, but it's also about continuity, it's about developing a career, it's about moving sideways, it's about advancement. So it's a broad concept. Um, of employability that has those dimensions. And realizing economic, social, and personal goals is reliant upon work-life learning. That is, that learning associated with the patient in working life. And that informed approaches and practices are need, needed to understand and support this learning, including clarity about key premises and its purposes. And erroneously and unfortunately, lifelong learning and lifelong education are often conflated. And this is typical of 
the um, policy agendas at national and supranational levels where these two concepts get joined together. But however, they're quite distinct. The former, lifelong education, is an institutional fact. That is, it arises from society. Often these programs are quite intentional in terms of the goals that they want to achieve. And this audience knows well the shift in the last um, 25 years from <clears throat> lifelong learning being being about cultural betterment through to having a very strong economic focus. Whereas the latter, lifelong learning, is a personal fact. It's something that is central to the individual and the individual decides and engages and constructs meaning from the experiences they've had. Um, to understand further what constitutes work-life learning requires elaborating how both sets of factors, both you know, the institutional facts, but also personal facts come together and constructs and, and, and forms and does so relationally. And this opens up then considerations of what constitutes lifelong education and how to acknowledge and support learning across working life. Now, the investigation, which um, is used to inform this, this talk, um, is, is, is as follows. It's about understanding further how working age Australians learning progresses and can be best be supported across their working lives. It's funded by the Australian Research Council through their discovery scheme. And essentially at its heart is a set of retrospective of adults' work-life histories, then monitoring learning longitudinally across working lives and these involve indigenous, native born, migrant, refugee, migrant informants from across genders and occupational categories, and then a survey. The team comprises um, my Henning Saling Olsen from Roskilde, uh, Laurent Filiates from Geneva, and also colleagues from Griffith, Sarojini Choi Ray, and Ray Smith. Um, senior research assistant, um, Anha Lee, and also um, Debbie Begali, who's an indigenous woman who provides specific insights and contributions um, from that community. Now, the driving this funded research project is as follows. What personal, educational, and workplace practices can best sustain employability? across working life. And in overview, the project is as follows. In the first phase, uh, we interviewed um, life histories of over, th about over 30 informants from diverse occupational classifications, gender, age, etc. And this process used the, the life history method that's been championed by um, Henning Selling Olson. And it comprised two interviews. In the first interview, it was just an open narrative where you the digital recorder and just asked the informant to talk about their entire work life history from their first instance of paid employment until now. And I should add that in this first phase, we selected people who were in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, because what we wanted was a, 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 you know, a retrospective history to identify across some period of time and in particular the transitions that these individuals had encountered and we captured from these first 30 informants over 200 instances of work-life transitions. So we were able to undertake from that as you'd appreciate both qualitative and quantitative analysis from this life interview data. In the second phase, um, what happened was COVID came along in case you hadn't realized that. <laughs> so the first phase was pretty much complete by the time COVID came along, we were able to continue with interviews online, et cetera. And in the second phase, the idea was to, to follow workers for a period of time, 14, 15 months to see about the changes they encountered at a level. However, COVID came along and what we decided to do was to change the focus, to focus on workers who'd been impacted by, by COVID-19. And 
Some of that was service workers, and in particular, we focused on workers in the airline industry, cabin crew, ground crew, uh, pilots, etc., as well as other groups. But it was particularly those from aviation that had been impacted by this change. Um, and so we monitored 30 informants and also did work-life history interviews with them. So we ended up with almost 60 work-life histories. And then we progressively engaged with them over a period of 14 months. Now, I have to say not all that went well because particularly those workers who'd been heavily impacted by, by COVID, some of them found it very difficult to continue a series of interviews, particularly those who were pilots who had, had lost their employment and were struggling to see a pathway back to employment in the work that was so important to them. And then in the third phase, <clears throat> which is about advancing policy and practice implication, we conducted a survey drawing upon the findings from the first two phases. And that survey um, gathered respondents of, of, of over, over 600 respondents. And we managed to get samples from the broad groups, which was native born Australians, indigenous Australians, um, migrants from English speaking countries, but also migrants from non countries, which included refugee migrants. So that was the study, but what I'm focusing on this today um, is the, the findings from phase one and two. So let me start by introducing one of our informants. I'll call him Salim. So to a Baha'i family in Iran, but after the 1979 Islamic revolution, he experienced religious persecution that restricted his education and work life options, and he faced perilous conscription. At that point in time, he was not able, allowed to work, and if he wanted to get the certification for his recently completed engineering degree, he converted to Islam, which he wasn't prepared to do. Also, Baha'i people were being were conscripted onto the front line in the war between Iran and Iraq. So, Consequently, he and his wife fled and came as refugees to Australia. He was unable to have his university education recognised and started to, to, to re, redo his degree, but found that he needed to care for his family. So over the next 35 years, he worked in a range of jobs, factory work, spare parts, driving buses and taxis, before gaining skills in and becoming a certified as a builder. And then he worked in that field for some years before a back injury required him to seek alternatives. He then secured a coffee shop franchise and, and then sometimes returning to taxi driving to maintain income before selling the franchise and becoming a project manager for a construction company. So Salem has experienced many transitions across his adult life each requiring significant learning to progress. These include becoming a husband and parent when religious persecution limited his education and employment options. Fleeing a country of his birth to establish life in a, in a very different country in Australia and needing to be competent in English to participate in education and work and then negotiating paid employment of different kinds and then becoming a builder, a coffee shop franchisee, and then as a project manager for a construction company. Shirley um, is now in her late 50s and is currently a casual administrative worker. She was born with a learning di disability, dyslexia, and she lived in an area of Australia where education support was limited, so she struggled through primary and secondary school and completed her schooling with limited literacy. Supported by her parents, she was found initial employment and then through vocational education programs, she learned occupational skills. Later, as an adult, she completed her tertiary preparation and graduated with a teaching degree. However, it wasn't successful. Her teaching, that she passed the degree, but the teaching career was short but she used her newly developed literacy skills to secure in local government. Yet she faced constant struggles and difficulties in some demanding aspects of that work, which led to her 
um, having a early retirement from full-time work. So Shirley, again, a pseudonym, um, had a number of transitions across her working life and to the present, including becoming a retail worker, beauty therapist, receptionist, high school teacher, clerical worker, undertaking a range of roles in local government before retiring because of work-related ill health and is now a casual administrative worker. Um, why focus on transitions across life? Well, learning required to negotiate them and their personal significant and significance and impact offers basis for understanding learning across working life. And it provides basis for capturing the processes of learning and its outcomes, that is development. Um, <clears throat> most accounts of development across the lifespan emphasize stages of different kinds. So Piaget is about you know, cognitive growth of children, Kohlberg, moral development, Erickson, psycho psychosocial development, Baltes, um, series of, of, of changes, and Levison, stages of adult development. And there's a focus then on whether and how in all of these, those transitions are negotiated and in what way are they resolved? Now, some of these accounts emphasize maturation, the brute fact of nature of, of biological growth. That could include Piaget, part of Baltes, for instance, and others refer to social and societal contributions such as Kohlberg and Erickson, and then some perhaps also emphasize the importance of, of personal factors, what the person brings to it. However, um, it seems to me that all three of these, the, the brute fact of maturation, the social and cultural contributions, and also personal factors are important and need to be included. And these help us understand what constitutes adults ontogenetic development, that is adults and um, people's development across the life course. And in particular, that individual's development is shaped by what Valsner refers to as pre-mediate experiences. Those experiences which shape and um, develop our understandings, which allow us to make sense of the moment, of the moment we have subsequent experiences. And of transition seem particularly pertinent now with occupational and workplace requirements constantly in flux and subject to frequent transformations. So um, from the life history interviews, these informants, um, the, the, the transitions that these negotiated were found to be initiated by six categories of work-life change. And these are as follows. Firstly, changes of, of, life, of life stages, maturation. And that is, could be, for instance, somebody reaching a point where they have responsibility for a family and need then to earn a more secure income or to down and provide a career. Or it could be the impact of aging on the body, which makes decisions about the kind of work that the person can do. Then there is the change of employment status of whether a person is seeking um, to progress, advancement, or whether they're struggling to actually advance a career and, uh, and retain employment. Then there is change of occupations, which are of three kinds, change in the occupation itself, or not the focus of the occupation, and change in the skills and capacities required for that occupation. And then changes in employment through restructuring or changed economic circumstances. And I guess we've seen a lot of that in the last years or so. Then there's also changes brought about by shift in loco location. And that can be either geographical or societal. That is people moving either within Australia or migrants coming to Australia, very different experience for those who are English speaking migrants, for those who are not, and those refugee migrants, but also, also indigenous um, Australians who are working and, you know, en engaging, working and engaging in Australian culture and the, the negotiations they have to confront. And then 
changes in physical and psychological health that arise across our lives. And that is of two kinds. Firstly, changes in personal health and well-being and changes in family health and well-being. And then finally, changes in personal lifestyle. And that is, these are personal facts. Now, when we captured these large number of transitions, we were able to do, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. In terms of changes, there's personal preferences and values, and then changes in subjectivity, how the person sees themselves as um, an adult worker, for instance. <clears throat> we were able to do an analysis on the first phase of data, which had 204 transitions. And from this, we're able to see those that were most prominent, that, that these factors which this change. And the most frequently cited one was personal lifestyle. And much of that was actually voluntary rather than involuntary. Involuntary was a relatively small number. The next one was then occupational changes about continuity or discontinuity. And only a smaller percentage, a smaller number were actually affected by discontinuity. And then there was employment status, stages of life, location, and then physical and psychological health were, were ranked, ranked less highly. So what became apparent from this is that personal and lifestyle and occupational changes were the most frequent, both voluntary and non-voluntary. And occupational change was mainly, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about continuity. And then the status was about advancement and um, discontinuity. In all of this, what can be seen is that there's matters of self here become important. Because as we know that, you know, one's occupation, one's work one does, is often very, very important to the majority of working age adults. So continuity, discontinuity, struggles for um, 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 sustaining employment status. These are all issues which are important to in individual subjectivity or sense of self. Um, we also are able to ascertain from analysis of these work-life histories, the kinds of learning that had been required for these individuals to negotiate these transitions across their working lives. And these are as follows. Firstly, language and literacy skills, the capacities both spoken and written were important in informant's trajectory, albeit in different ways, depending upon the kind of work, the kind of trajectory that individuals were doing and were seeking to achieve. And so that these capacities were important. And I'm sure we can appreciate that somebody as coming as a refugee migrant from a non-English speaking background has one challenge, but other people had other kinds of challenge, learning how to engage and use literacy in ways that perhaps they hadn't been prepared for in schooling or early life. One was cultural practices, the norms, forms, and practices associated with the nation's political, social, and educational systems institutional mores, occupational requirements, and those associated with, um, with, with, with the individual's faith and family traditions. And so people like Salim, for instance, was talking about the challenges he faced when he came to Australia, one of which he mentioned was being offered social welfare benefits, which from his culture was something which was almost offensive, that if he couldn't care for himself, he couldn't earn a living, he couldn't prepare for his family, he somehow was deficit because he wasn't used to a social welfare system. Then there is the world of work, which involves the requirements for paid employment, including being productive, punctual, reliable, solving problems and being responsive to the needs of workplaces and those that they serves. And this extends to understandings of different occupations and career pathways. So how, um, how the learning associated with going into a new occupation and, and, and a new workplace and understanding those, those mores. Then there was the work-life engagement, which involves individuals' responses to an engagement in work 
as their circumstances change or are changed. That is how th these individuals come to engage, these informers come to engage with the transitions and learn from them and, and derive meaning from them, but also fit them within other priorities. So some of our um, some of our informants made choices about the kind of work that they did and the pathways they followed based upon not only their own needs but also their family needs. So Salim um, ceased his struggle to retake re his education degree because he needs family. His wife um, was eligible to get into medicine but she was not able to commit the length of time to do a medical degree because she also had to care for her children. So there's this decisions about how work life is engaged. And then fifthly, the occupational skills, developing the capacity individuals need to be employed and to, to secure ongoing employment. Now, what's interesting when you look at this list is that much of the emphasis on lifelong education is directed towards the development of occupational skills. But as you can see here, these are just, that's just one form of the kind of knowledge which these informants told us they needed to, to learn to secure their transitions across life. And this figure here seeks to capture somewhat awkwardly, um, some bringing together of these, um, of these concepts. So on the left hand side, you have the factors which initiate those transitions and the kinds of transitions that they comprise that, that initiates them, the changes that, that, that arise. And then from that, then there's the particular kinds of learning that are required, language, literacy, culture, those ones. Have. And then from below this idea of the kind of support that arises for um, that learning, whether it's from work-based experiences, you know, support within workplaces, whether it's from education institutions or whether it's from family and community and how that development occurs. And then the outcomes arising from that right-hand side. Now, in some way, this is a, a linear process because you progress through it over time, but these were initial set of factors and, and structures of way of thinking about these transitions. So in terms of um, work life learning is that much of the incremental learning that occurs between these transitions is, is very, very important and arises through we, what we know is a personal agency and engagement and also um, from, from external support, which may be important at certain points in time, but other, other times it can be quite minimal or even unnecessary as adults learn through engagement in, in, in their work activities. So not all of that incremental learning is premised upon um, educational provisions as such, attending a course and being certified. And that tended to predominate when, when significant transitions were being um, negotiated by these informants. And importantly, when learning was not able to be discovered, dis dis secured by discovery efforts, that required access to and guidance within a socially generated domain of knowledge, such as language or occupation. And that effortful engagement was important, but also support from outside the person, education, family, co-workers, et cetera, were important. So when that incremental learning couldn't be accessed through discovery efforts, through trial and error, et cetera. That is when a particular set of qualities were required. Guidance within that domain, effortful engagement by the learner, but also um, structured support, um, external sources. And hence the importance of the intentionality for learning across working life. It wasn't always singularly focused, Often our informants had a number of goals they were seeking to achieve or options that they were considering. And sometimes it was short term, but sometimes it was long term and strategic and coherent, but usually by some degree. 
and that individuals' education across working life is was found to be personally shaped, enacted, and mediated. And importantly, it was often only the individual who could make judgments about their relative success. So different is for the kind of work that some people might see as being not worthwhile. For these individuals, these were significant steps, these were significant processes, and sorry, uh, these were significant outcomes for them personally. I'm reminded here what Pinar said in terms of curriculum theorizing about you can only consider that in terms of what's important to the individual, not necessary vital um, esteem. And it was found that a range of experiences and support assisted our informants participation and learning. And these comprises what are referred to as educative experiences afforded and suggested by the social world. There's a lot of Dewey in here and stated that the education process has no end beyond itself. It's its own end. It's a process of living. And that's from Democracy and Education, 1916. So I think we need to account for the continuities and discontinuities across transitions and working life, failures, lack of success, which as Levison says, are important in understanding work life and development, uh, but from the informant's perspective. And securing these transitions, what we found was there were three key factors which were helpful in individuals securing those outcomes. Person, education, provisions, and community. And here we put the notion of, of person plus education plus community. And so the person is the, the person actively engaging in, in a process of learning. And then instances, educational provisions of different kinds, not just attending college, but could be franchisee training. It could be structured learning in the workplace as being important. But what came through and perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not surprising for some of the audience, was the power of community, the contribution of community, and that family, um, cultural affiliations, employers, the invitations to, to engage, the societal sentiments associated with work, societal sanctioning, such as the esteem that work was held in, and the provision of certification were important. So here, it would seem that educate experiences were more than just lifelong education provisions, that is participating in courses. Running through this is, is what Sylvia Gheriardi referred to as the practices of community. Now Sylvia never, I don't think she, in her study in, in Trento of a fertility clinic, we didn't think about this kind of, or didn't intend this kind of application. But when we look about the way the community supports this learning, you can't help return to the concept that she articulated about that workplace in Italy. And in terms of educative experiences, it was, um, we found that there were four kinds of these broad educative experiences. The first one was guidance towards and providing opportunities for individuals to engage in work activities for which they learn and would have otherwise be unavailable. And invitations to engage in activities and interactions be otherwise unavailable. Now, let me just take these first two and provide an example. One of the informants was a, um, a captain of a 777 who flew intercontinentally. In March 2020, he was the king of the skies, so to speak. Two weeks later, he was unemployed. He was also concerned about being unemployable because when he was in his mid fifties and he knew that when the airline industry took um, to the skies again, that he would have to go through a regime of training, which is expensive and he would be a lower priority because of the various costs associated with it. He also knew that as a pilot, 
when he reaches the age of 60, he has to be crewed on with a younger co-pilot, which then be, makes him a problem for scheduling and less likely perhaps to be invested in by an airline. And then he also knew that the age of 65, he would be unable to fly intercontinentally because the legislation doesn't allow. So he was, um, he was uncertain about his future, to put it mildly. And so he undertook a law degree and, and he tried to then to find this new career, this new occupation. He'd already done a certificate in aviation law. So this wasn't outside of his ken. He was actually considering some form of specialism after his um, airline, his pilot's career finished. However, one of the, one of the affordances that he was able to access was that he, being a pilot, was a member of the local golf club. And some of the other members of the golf club were barristers, solicitors, and lawyers. And through them, he then gained information and insights, but also he was offered um, the part-time work while he was doing his degree in a law practice so that he could come to, make, to, to be informed about it. Now, the point is that if he were not a member of the golf club, he wouldn't have had access to those kind of experiences. So I guess sitting in this is what's sometimes referred to as, as cultural capital. And so he was able to provide opportunities, guidance and support in that learning. And so support and mediation and access to knowledge required for engaging those activities, which you would not learn on your own. And so through that, doing a law degree and engaging in practice, he was also able to develop further those capacities. And then able to <coughs> excuse me guide the development of those capacities because he was working with people that knew him respected him but also were perhaps sympathetic to his situation and provided him him support and then the importance of acknowledging and capturing and rewarding and certifying that knowledge which would be of his degree but also the requirements for legal practice before he could actually take up work as a solicitor. So there were these broad sets of educative experiences, and these I think are um, more expansive, <coughs> excuse me, more expansive than those that um, are perhaps seen as being about um, lifelong educational programs and provisions. Now, to provide an overview of that, let's just take a, a quick view through some of others who've had these, um, who've done analysis on. So when we looked at these, these five forms of educative experiences, we found as most frequent was that which guides and towards and provides opportunities. That was the one that was mentioned most. This data comes from both phase one and phase two. By this time, we had over 300, um, well over 300, um, uh, transitions that we could we could um, draw upon, and so the most the first one then was these the guide support and guidance, and there's an example of of Alex first of all of somebody who had particular experiences in two different companies and learned about the different kinds of work and different kinds of work values, <clears throat> and then the importance of capturing, rewarding and certification from Parker. And what's indicated here in the airline sector was the importance of building up the hours, but also that pathway of, of, of moving from flying small planes to larger planes to multi-engine planes, etc. And the, the pathway that was made available at each stage, there was certification and acknowledgement that was required to progress along that pathway. And then there was you know, this support and, um, act and, and guide to, uh, sorry, access to direct guidance to support the learning of Dave, who was returning to university and then went on to complete um, a, 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 a teacher education and become a, a teacher. And then from Danim, Danim um, was from a family of Vietnamese refugees from another generation. And he had only ever worked within family. He'd never worked for anybody else. His entire work life was associated with family of running, first of all, a restaurant, I beg your pardon, a pool hall, 
then a restaurant, and then into a grocery store. And through that, and how to <clears throat> manage a grocery store as his parents aged, but also part of that was learning how to go to the, the market to purchase vegetables and to purchase fish. And he was provided with very direct guidance from somebody within his family who had had more experience of that. And then, <clears throat> and down the bar, been in, invited to engage in activities and interactions that otherwise would be unavailable to her. So what this sets out then is this broad array of educative experiences and the roles that they play in the work-life development and transitions of performance. And moving on then from the concepts of educative um, activities through to the concept of personal curriculums. Now, the contemporary orthodox view of curriculum and curriculum is often you know, defined in terms of a pathway to progress along, a course way to, a course to follow, is associated with institutional goals, processes and practices, albeit mainly educational institutions, but also workplace own sets of pathways that you need to progress along. So here, what, what is advanced is the concept of a personal curriculum, which views curriculum quite differently. It offers a basis to capture individuals' personally unique experiences across their life course, included, but not being defined as provided through intentional education experiences. Now, most of well, so the definition that this draft definition here is a bit long, sorry about that, is that defined as personal pathways of activities and interactions across the lifespan are shaped independently by what is afforded the social world and, and mediated by maturation, engaged with intentionally and unintentionally by individuals that shapes and is shaped by their ontogenetic development. Now here, this, this view accommodates the brute fact of maturation as well as institutional and personal factors. And importantly, it distances curriculum from being constituted largely by as an institutional fact, something intended um, and enacted through um, social institutions. And it, even when the experience curriculum is advanced, the experience curriculum is, is usually by, is, is perceived as being something in response to what is, um, uh, what is intended and enacted by social institutions, such as schools, colleges, universities, workplaces, etc. So here, um, a different approach has been taken. However, it's not totally novel. If we look back at early theorizing of curriculum, people's earlier work, what we find that is this, this was the case, that curriculum was seen as a personal pathway. However, this was perhaps um, changed with um, the focus on education institutions, perhaps best captured by Tyler's work in 1949, that seminal text that he wrote, which really shifted to curriculum being seen as being, which was positioned with the institutional, the dominant discourse of schooling. So it moved, it shifted from being something about persons to being something about institutions, which I think is pr predominant today. Um, and so representing these personal curriculums is, is, is important. So um, it's helpful to understand the journey across working life. I think it allows transitions to be identified and uh, illuminated, sorry, spelling mistakes there, and how they were initiated, negotiated, and mediated through combinations of personal and brute institutional factors. And it provides a means to elaborate specific educative experiences that support work-life learning. And it permits evaluating what constitutes life and how it can support work-life learning of different kinds and what constitutes learning goals and how these need to be achieved. And it's an explanatory account which places the person's learning and, and change center stage. However, finding ways of representing these life scientific publication actually comprises a significant challenge. 
it's not easy. So this is Alex, who you introduced to earlier. He had what we identified as six key transitions across his working life. And here you see a representation on a table down the left hand column, the transitions that we've identified and he agreed to, and that the, the detailing of those transitions. In the third column to, to the right, you'll see the kinds of changes which we identified, which were those I mentioned from those I mentioned earlier about those that occurred during each of these uh, transitions. And then in the right hand column, those factors mediating and supporting that change. However, this um, life history um, here, um, view here, um, account here is just one of 59 that we have. So how do we represent this? And um, this is, a, I think, a naive and an initial attempt to do that by looking at each of the, of the, the, the 30 um, informants from the first phase and trying to identify in the various transitions they had the role that person, education and played within it. As you'll see, it's awkward and not particularly clear. So that's a task we're working on. How do we represent this? We thought there would be easy solutions in the work-life history literature about how to do this. However, we have been disappointed in what we have found to date. So there's a challenge here for us. And importantly, this structure, the incremental learning that occurs um, between these key transitions. So to almost to finish then, so reconstituting lifelong education and work-life learning. So I think these explanatory concepts offer ways of capturing what constitutes work-life learning, what is afforded adults on the one hand and mediated by them. And I think they position and elaborate work-life learning as a socio-personal process shaped by institutional, personal and brute facts. And given that we are talking about the development across the adult lifespan, it's so important that we include maturation and the brute fact of, of, of change that is brought around by it. That's not to say it's negative, it's simply to say that occurs. It's, it's an, it, we, we cannot leave maturation out of the discussion. And that these <clears throat> personal journeys comprising curriculums or pathways that are personal particular need to be understood in their own terms. Take the perspectives of the indigenous informants and the way that their pathways have been shaped by their and society's response to them um, is, is quite relevant. And this reconstitutes lifelong education as being something that need to be seen in far more broadly than experiences provided by intentional educational programs and institutions to be more inclusive of a wider accounting of educative experiences. In particular, the practices of communities stands to be salient here. So I think this opens up policy and practice options beyond taught programs to consider personal pathways, community engagement, and assisting negotiate work-life transitions. So what, to finish? Um, I think it helps make important distinctions between lifelong learning and lifelong education, which, as I mentioned, are often conflated within the policy discourse, particularly by, by key um, super government agencies such as the, the OECD. And these, which drive then governmental responses, I should add, um, these adult working life is, is personally defined, societally shaped and framed by brute facts and emphasizes their complexity, their complex tendency. And Dewey referred in, in oh, 1910 to the idea that as um, humans become more complex, more, the, 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 their development becomes more, demand, more, more complex, their engagement with the social world becomes more negotiated and ambivalent. Given that change, it's, it's so important that we see this relationship between the person and the world they engage in, the social and the physical world they engage in, as being something which is to, to, 
to some degree, highly personal, dependent and specific. The transitions they encountered and need are personally distinct. I think I've made this point in scope and frequency across working lives as evidenced by their diverse personal curriculum. The English speaking migrant coming to Australia has a very different set of, of challenges than the non-English speaking refugee migrant in particular. And their learning and development was mediated among personal agency and intentionality interdependently with what is afforded by educative experiences in the broader sense in educational programs and then through the practice of the community. So beyond the lifelong education discourse, educative experiences cast broadly, I'm repeating myself, um, to need to include experience, provide advice, opportunities, support and guide access and furnish bases for assisting um, individuals negotiate these transitions. So beyond individual agency and intentionality, educational provisions of what is afforded by communities, these adults variously sanction support that help the sanction support and provide access to opportunities and augment adults learning and development. So lifelong educative experiences and personal pathways are facilitated by the practices of their communities. So thanks for that. I'll stop now and hopefully have the opportunity to engage in and perhaps I should stop sharing the slide so that I can see the questions. I can go back to the slides, I think, if, if that's necessary. So I'll stop sharing and I'll have a look at the questions in the um, in the chat. I hope I'll that was useful. You. Yeah, okay. certainly. I'll help you with that, Stephen. I'll uh, read off the names. I've been keeping a list. Uh, oh, they're coming in a lot faster now. <coughs> um, first of all, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, for your contribution of this talk. I could see some icons of clapping and uh, very much so. I want to go to the first person on my list. I have Presha Ramzarup. Uh, I'm going to try to help allow Presha to ask her question. <laughs> and uh, then I have uh, Katie Endegar, uh, Marcelo Vieta. Let me just find um, Presha. Presha. By the way, folks, I do apologize. I had COVID and I've just returned from seven days hotel quarantine in Singapore. <clears throat> and I've got a COVID, I hope it's post-COVID cough. So I, I do apologize if I'm nope. coughing a bit. <clears throat> no, no problem. I can't seem to find pressure. She might have left us. I'm going to go to uh, Katie Entegar. Katie, um, Neil, allow Katie's uh, screen to be shown if you can. And uh, Katie, you're welcome to ask your question of, uh, of her keynote. <coughs> Uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't put a question in the chat, Peter, but um, I appreciate the keynote very much. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Oh, very good. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and then I next I had Marcelo Vieta on my list. Um, let me find Marcelo and unmute him. Marcelo Vieta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi Marcelo. Hi. Yeah. Hi, how you doing, Professor Billet? Thank you so much for that most Stephen, thorough yeah. keynote. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Um, what specific um, structural barriers or policy barriers did you find in the lifelong learning and education pathway for professional development in Australia um, in your current research? Is there anything that stands out as far as structural barriers uh, that perhaps might be gender uh, biased or race biased? Um, and does your research kind of pull that out as well? So this is this is kind of like the 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 other side of the affordances, the barriers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, uh, when I talk about affordances, affordances can be positive or negative. They can be restrictive or you know inviting people in. Um, right. my, 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 the broad answer I'll give you is um, that there, that all of the all of the um, <clears throat> all of the kind of issues that play out um, in society about inclusion, exclusion, etc., often visit these these circumstances. Um, and there's no I'm surprised about that. But let me start with a couple of things. Firstly, the um, <clears throat> 
firstly, the um, one of the key problems we face with professional development um, is that it has to adhere often to administrative requirements of educational institutions and government institutions. So rather than having um, exploiting, for instance, learning arrangements in the work, um, rather than um, having embrace finding ways of embracing what I've been talking about, the contributions that come from individuals' communities. Unfortunately, most of the ways, the mechanisms, the, the, the structures are associated with the number of people sitting on seats and for how long, because that are the, they, these are the requirements. And for instance, there's a lot of talk by government about extending professional development into the workplace, but whether you're talking about healthcare, I do work with doctors, etc., cetera, um, that because you cannot allocate you know, hours against um, the time that people are engaging in those activities, it tends to fall over. So there's, there's, there's that issue, which I, I think is a problem. But one of the reasons I think for doing this kind of research is that we get to find out what works and doesn't work. Now, I've just finished a large project in Singapore about continuing education and training and, and participation in it. And one of the requirements, because these courses are funded, is that attendance is compulsory. And that to me seemed to be a barrier for participation, particularly for women who would have young children and might struggle to get to attend to the polytechnic you know, two nights a week or whatever. However, through interviewing some of those women, I found out that wasn't true. What I found out was that actually by making it compulsory, that actually empowered them to say to their husbands or you know, his husbands in Singapore, that, <clears throat> um, you know, you've got to look after the kids tonight because I'm going to the polytechnic. So um, there's, that's why we need to look at these things in terms of affordances of, on the one hand, it, compulsory attendance is restrictive, but actually you find that, for instance, it might actually empower, um, um, you know, in that case, women to actually say, no, this is my time, I've got to go, I have to go. So it's, there's a different set of factors. What um, was interesting with some of the indigenous, um, um, well, the informants, and um, two in particular, is that they were actually subject to almost too much affordances by government. They were constantly being <clears throat> invited to go onto training programs of quite different kinds, which were um, almost incoherent in terms of them identifying a pathway. You know, one minute horticulture, next minute doing something like work, and another one doing something quite different within a very short period of time. So again, I think it's important that we focus on the needs of individuals and their trajectory and question um, the even the best of intended um, mechanisms to um, engage, um, engage um, individuals in what is broadly referred to as, as professional de development and not making assumptions. But a lot of the issues are around access, um, hours, um, and in particular, there's a big delineation between those who are actually working in the field and able to get development hours of kinds than those who are seeking to enter the field who, who can't. So I'm not, I'm not sure I'm answering your question particularly well, Marcelo, except to say that um, there's, from this study, we're working on the, 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 the um, survey data at the moment, which has over 670 respondents, as I mentioned. And there the focus is policy issues. And this is, this is part of, of the ongoing work that we're doing. Um, but I think it's, it's understanding what are the affordances from these kind of you know, rich individual accounts, which helps us understand the way that perhaps policy um, can best be organized. And some of it is, is questioning for taking for granted assumptions. No, I hope that's a little bit. Yes, that's and and, and the nuances in um, that you mentioned in Singapore and and amongst the over affordances of indigenous groups. I think that's really really fascinating. Those are fascinating findings that add nuance to to the argument. So that's very good. Thank you very much.
You're most welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next on my list, I have Karen Ingram, Dr. Karen Ingram. Is she, uh, let me bring her up here. Hi, Karen. So I'm here. Can you see? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Yep. Wonderful. I'm so honored to speak with both of you today. Um, and our project actually aligns with yours. And so I had a quick question um, about Paulo Freire when he speaks about conscientization and how that relates to your project. Um, right now I'm studying his theory of revolutionary action. Um, and so I'm drawing a lot of um, kind of relating it to what's going on in America today and um, the, the social implications and social justice. So I wanted to see if um, any of those sort of relate to what you're doing. Yeah, look, thanks for the question. I have to confess that I've read um, Freire's work for, for some time, but, but I think the key point is that he centered two th on two things. Firstly, the community. Um, but he also centered on his focus on individuals. And he wanted, as I understand it, to, to emancipate people by providing basic education for them so that numerate and could negotiate, for instance, in, in the sales of, their, of, the, of, of, of the produce that they, they grew. Um, and I think at, at that level, that there's this, uh, uh, there is similarities of, of the focus of, on local engagement, understanding the local situation, the community in which people engage in, but also, um, but also the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the very specific focus on understanding the needs of those who are to be educated and not making assumptions, which goes a little bit back to my, my previous question. Um, and I thought what was obviously interesting about Freire's work is, although I'm no expert on it, is that um, his pathway to um, emancipation was through providing a, a fairly a fairly structured and fairly pragmatic um, um, edu ed ed base education and um, to provide the structures. You'll notice in a couple of the instances um, the, some of our informants, like myself, by the way, I failed at school and um, didn't have, you know, pathway to university as a young person. And I'm sure my deputy headmaster who um, took a great dislike to me would be horrified to know that I'm a professor in a university. Mm -hmm. But so that there's a whole pathway that you see of people who have a good schooling because they're, ref they're refugees or that um, life didn't play out like that or they weren't engaged in that and that i think that 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 lesson about providing the mechanism so that people can progress through is so important for instance the age of when i when i started my um, um teacher qualification was um, um in my 30s i didn't know what a sentence was because the education I had in Britain was called progressive education and people like me who were bound to work in factories, which is what I did, didn't need to understand English language. So I'm quite sympathetic to the idea of empowering um, adults by um, providing you know, the, the foundational education that they may not have missed out. One of the interesting of well they're all interesting these cases there was a woman who was a retail worker in the united kingdom and somebody just suggested to her that she seemed for, you know bright and intelligent that she might like to do um an adult education degree and so as a mature age woman she undertook um a, a social work degree like an open university thing in britain and was then became a social worker and realized that she could make that contribution. She hadn't even thought that she could have done a, undertaken a degree there alone, have that kind of work. Then she went on to, her husband was transferred to Australia. She came to Australia, was in the social, in the youth justice system here. And then um, she was working with young people, decided she wanted to become um, a, a teacher. And so she did an education degree, became a teacher, and then became a deputy principal. Now that's a trajectory from somebody who was, you know, essentially a, a retail worker who didn't have any expectations 
but the educational pathway for her has been assisted by those educations, but also that provided the, the um, opportunity for her to see that there were things that she could achieve that perhaps her social circumstances had not allowed to see that as a young woman. So I don't know how that relates to that conscientization that you're referring to, but I think it opens up. The work I'm doing in healthcare in Australia with trying to encourage young Indigenous people to um, participate in healthcare work, a similar issue comes up. And part of the, the problem of getting young Indigenous people to come into the healthcare sector is that they, they don't come across many Indigenous doctors or nurses or other healthcare workers and so the concept here and I'm sure it's the same in Canada is that if you can't see it you can't be it so we have to find ways of in the community of providing opportunities so that working age adults can actually see that certain things are achievable for them um okay so I, I, <coughs> excuse me I hope that begins to uh, answer your question Karen to confess of, I haven't really thought about this research in terms of um, of Freire's work and perhaps I should. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you Stephen and, and thank you for the good question uh, Karen. Uh, next on my list is uh, Ramo Lardini. Uh, Ramo, um, I'll try to find you on my list to unmute you if that's what's needed or maybe you can do it yourself, let me find you. Okay. Uh, try Ramo, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ask your question, please. I will. Greetings, Stephen. Good to see you again, sir. Hi, how are you going? Stephen, oh, I'm pretty good. Amongst your informants, have you come across the sector that is um, either, well, that's been associated with incarceration? Um, I'm just wondering to what extent, if you have found anything in that work life learning, you know, learning across the lifespan, to what extent has, if you have seen it, does it implicate people's ability to learn for work? And how do you see that playing out in the quality of life? <coughs> Thank you very much for your question. I have to confess, no. Okay. But, um, that they certainly the, the, the which which might be I mean we've done our best by the way to include um, to be as inclusive as possible um, but um, certainly nobody has volunteered they've had experience of incarceration um, what we clearly have though is particularly from the indigenous um, informants from the life history ones constraints placed upon people because of the way that society views them and, and also how they see themselves because of that it's that sort of um it's that concept of gaze that works which works both ways but to be honest with Roman, I, I can't really I, it would be it would be improper of me to to speculate on that because i simply haven't um i'm just racking my tiny mind but I can't think of an example that um, would inform that. Um, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I mean, it's uh, the method you described, though, Stephen, is, is open to these kind of serious life transitions that Ramo yeah. is describing. Yeah. It's just it, it might be the case that didn't show up in your, your data set, you know, at this stage. Um, I wanted to use a little bit of privilege uh, to insert a, a question from uh, the um, uh, the introducer to you, Armig Adurian. Uh, you know, she's uh, been kind of immersed in your work. And I'm wondering if Armig, you have a question you might like to ask Stephen. It just seems only fair. Uh, you introduced him. You should be allowed to ask a question. Want to I, sure, I'll, I'll ask one, Stephen. Hopefully this makes sense. Um, it occurred to me actually as you were um, making your presentation, I like this concept of transitions that you were talking about and using that to inform your research and specifically the point that you made about the distinction between lifelong learning and lifelong education and how they were conflated. Um, but now you're looking to sort of move those forward into delineating this idea of a personal pathway 
or personal curriculum. And I was just curious to understand more about, and if, if you have anything more to add around how you identified and developed what would constitute a personally unique pathway of experience and how much it came from the lived experience of your research participants. Just curious about like how do you, um, in the process, for example, of interviewing the Salim that you mentioned, did you did you happen to think, oh, well, he's mentioning some new things, maybe we can add them to our definition, or how did you develop that? I was just curious. Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, essentially the, the life history method, um, which was assisted greatly by Henning, um, as co a contribution to the project, we did these in the first round, we did these interviews and we just, you know, people spoke to 45 minutes or an hour, often without prompting. And from that, we then analyzed and we looked for key transition moments. And so we identified these transitions. And then in the subsequent interview, we actually said to these people, hey, hey, do, 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 they, do you recognize these as key transitions? So we, we had an affirmative to answer. That then provided us with individual, but also across the cohort of these transitions that they'd taken place. And then we've placed them on spreadsheets and can analyze them. And from that, if these pathways become very clear. So it, what was, I guess, from my theorizing is that I've always felt that the, the experience curriculum, you know, rather than the intended is ultimately the most important because I'm interested in people's learning. And, but what I realized was that the, the concepts of the experience curriculum relate only to those times that individuals are engaged in educational programs or, or in my own writing, particular workplace experiences. And what I realized is that the see in terms of capturing the trajectory of, um, of, uh, of people's learning, because if we use the, the orthodox approach to curriculum, it's very much constrained by you know, educational provisions. Now, as you move out of childhood and uh, adolescence into adulthood, what you find is that um, that ad most adults in with, you know, formalized educational programs becomes far less important and only occurs at certain times when people need to change. And for some of them, it doesn't occur once they've it isn't necessary once they've completed their initial occupational preparation. So, the, <coughs> excuse me. So that concept of the institution curriculum seemed to me inadequate, but it seemed to be totally inadequate in accounting for the trajectories that people have and explain their trajectories, but also illuminating and elaborating them. Because if you were to try and capture these adults um, work life histories in terms of the intended of the enacted, um, experience curriculum, there would be massive gaps in all. Mm -hmm. So that's what led to that consideration of the personal curriculum. And it built upon things that I've been thinking about the experience curriculum as it pertained. However, engaging with the curriculum, um, uh, curriculum theoretical literature, it's interesting to go back to see that some of earlier perspectives, as I mentioned, Bobbitt, Frank Bobbitt, although he went on to do some stuff which was quite different, in his early theorizing, he, he emphasized the importance of that life journey. Dewey similarly um, emphasized that. But mm -hmm. as, as we know, what happens um, is the institutional overlay became very strong. And Tyler's definition of curriculum in 1949 in his book, um, which is seen as being seminal, is that curriculum is about achieving the goals of the school. Mm. Um, and that is totally inadequate for understanding. So that's, um, the, I mean, the current work I'm doing, current paper that I'm trying to prepare and, and um, set up for publication, um, sorry, submit for publication, is trying to make sense of this personal curriculum and how it sits within our existing conceptions of curriculum which are shaped mainly by rather than personal considerations. So that's the, that's the genesis of that. And that's how it's come through um, from the data, but it's so explicit in terms of the, once we, you set these um, at working age adults um, uh, life histories out and become so explicit, the kind of changes that they've had and the need for that and make sense of it. 
I don't know if that's helpful. No, it's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, um, given that you're going to probably give an answer to this, and we have two speakers, and I'm going to cut off the speaker list after these, but I think as a closing set, I'm going to ask the the um, the uh, the questioners to pose their question one after another, and you can kind of integrate their uh, responses given our time frame a little bit. So the first questioner will be Gemma Piercy, and then I'm going to ask uh, Kieran Merchandani is next. I'll have them ask their questions one after another, and then you can respond to uh, elements of it together as our closing response, if that's okay. So Gemma Piercy, um, let me unmute you if... Oh, sorry, yeah. New Zealand here, that's great. Yeah, Morena Stephen, <laughs> good <Hi>. morning. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to quickly, uh, firstly, f fantastic presentation. Um, I, lots of things that I'm going to carry into my own. But um, uh, I r was really fascinated by um, the story of the airline pilots. Uh, and in particular, you talked about um, the, the stickability of their identity in the, in the transitions. And I mean, I know that you also talked about one who transitioned into being a lawyer. And so I just wanted to know if you going to explore that more like how you know prestigious status identities might um, influence your ability to transition you know in terms of employ future employability and and, and before you answer Stephen uh, we'll just pack two questions in a row and have you close with some comments uh, Kieran Merchandani is our final questioner yeah, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Very interesting. I, I guess I have just a broad, I'm just really interested in your reflections on uh, this, you know, this concept of educative experiences that you've developed. And I, I, you know, I was thinking as I was listening to listening to you speak, like whether, you know, all experiences or what, how we should kind of put boundaries, whether we should put boundaries around what is an educative experience, something that you know, I've been struggling with a fair bit too. Like, would one call experiences of harassment or racism or sexism uh, or violence, educative experiences, you know? And so I just really like to, um, I'm sure you've thought about that and I'm just really like to hear your, your reflections on, you know, how one thinks about things as educative experiences or certain phenomenon as educated, educational, educative experiences. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, firstly, to Gemma. Um, yes, by the way, that airline pilot is now has moved to America and is flying domestically in America. Um, but one of the features of doing this work is uh, these life histories is that enga you engage with these people. And with the pilots, it was gut wrenching. Um, these people were interviewed. I think in all instances, we didn't complete all the interviews because it was just too much for these people. Um, and a series of interviews merely reinforced the difficulties they faced. That sense of um, subjectivity, of loss of self, was so powerful and palpable. One pilot angrily said to me that one of his colleagues was now doing the lollipop signs for kids crossing the road. Another was filling shelves in supermarkets. So that, that sense of self was profound and had huge impacts. And that's why, for instance, even, you know, not even, but also interviewing those refugee migrants, it became um, so important to do uh, their data. You know, there was tears, tears were flowed in some of these interviews. So it's, it's, it's powerful stuff and we, we need to respect it as researchers. And that from that, that whole issue, yes, of subjectivity or self became through palpable. That's why in my presentation, I was constantly referring to the personal, the personal throughout, because that was so in you know, the, the manifestation of somebody with a highly privileged position suddenly losing it very quickly and not knowing whether they'll ever get back to that position was, was palpable and the impact it has on that person and those around them was, was, was quite strong. Um, so yes, and that's something I want to pursue. And the real, the, the struggle that I mentioned is how do we do justice to this data? How do we do justice to it with these long narratives and it doesn't convert into scientific publications as as best i can see so that's one of the struggles we're having at the moment how to do that now with them um, um with kieran's um question yes i mean that, that that's broad issue of of 
what is afforded. And as I said earlier, affordances, people often see affordances as being positive, the positive invitation, but affordances can be negative, can be restrictive. What I've tried to position this concept as educative experiences, and you'll see in the definitions I use, was it is those that enabled something to occur if they hadn't been there, wouldn't have occurred. Uh, the language is awkward at the moment. These are nascent concepts I'm working on, and we're working on, I should say, but but they're, um, <coughs> they're, they're, they're awkward. So what I'm trying to do there is actually, um, yes, of course, there are restrictions that people had. You know, one of the examples, I uh, one of time to use it was, of the woman I referred to who, be, who, who went from being a, a retail worker through to um, a deputy principal of a school, one of the experience she had was that she one day attended a professional development session. And that afternoon, in quite a different suburb, she took her dog to one of those dog exercises and had a conversation with another woman there. And she said, oh, I've been to this professional development thing. I'd really like to do that kind of work. And it just so happened the woman said, well, actually, I'm from that unit and we have a vacancy coming up in November. And guess what? She got the job. But then Debbie, our Indigenous um, um, colleague, came in and said, yes, but that's one talking to another white woman. If, the, if it had been an Indigenous woman, she would, that conversation would never have occurred. So it's happen chance in some sense, but the, the quality of the happen chance is also shaped by by those um, cultural uh, factors. So yes, so that this, Karen, this is something that we need to work through in the literature, uh, in, in the data to look at this concept of educative um, uh, experiences. It goes back, you know, I'm drawing on Dewey a lot here, but to see the way that it affords in a positive sense advancement rather than affords in a negative sense constraints, how these can help overcome the situation so that indigenous woman would have the same kind of um, of um, interaction that the the anglo woman did i don't know if that's helpful thank you uh steven i'm uh, uh going to we're just a little over time although yeah. it's really dead on time i really appreciate it i um i'll just give you another uh, uh instead of all the private thank yous i've given you oh, i see some fans clapping coming up I want to give you a public thank you for this uh, talk and for being such a steadfast supporter of the conference series and for staying with the conference uh, in your commitment with the keynote. I really appreciate it. Uh, for everyone else, thank you so much. The questions were wonderful. Um, we have a little bit of a break. Uh, luckily, we've patterned that into our, our program so that people can get a tea um, and, or, or breakfast or a T-bone steak, probably, if, they, if they're evening somewhere. And uh, then all the all important paper uh, presentations will be starting our maiden voyage into those. Again, be generous with each other, uh, help your uh, moderator, your volunteer moderator wherever you can, and we'll see you in the sessions. Thank you very much. I'm gonna end the session. I'll stop the recording. Stephen, again, thank you. Thanks, Peter, for the invitation. Thanks, Colin, for participating. Thank you very much.